morning. So we're going to talk about designing for extensibility today. I'm Michael Hammond. I'm an architect on the Business Central team. I've worked a lot with extensions and extensibility in the past few years. And I'm Bardo Knudsen. I'm an application architect. And I and Gerd are doing basically the same as you guys. Yep. So my name is Piquet Wenks, and I do the same thing as Bardo, uh, application architect and lately um, focused on extensibility and how to get there. Okay, so real quickly, our agenda, we're gonna talk a little bit about background, um, what we've been doing, how we've gotten to the point where we're at right now with Business Central. Um, then we're gonna talk a little bit about the current state of where we're at, give some examples on how to extend, and finally, we'll talk a little bit about some upgrade considerations when you're dealing with extensions. So starting off with the background, apparently when you Bing for extensions, the first image that comes up is hair extensions. And if you let your colleague make your transition slide, it ends up on your transition slide. So we've talked, if you've been paying attention the last few years, we've talked a lot about a couple of things, extensibility, extensibility, and extensibility. So how did we get to a point to where we're so focused on this and that's what we talk about all the time? So going back, if you remember, NAV 2015, it wasn't an issue. It was all source code modification. We, Microsoft, would work for a couple years, create a big ball of code, throw it over the fence to you, and you would change it to do whatever you wanted. And that we'd do that regularly, and you'd have to figure out how to merge it, and it worked great for us. You guys figure it out. But there's a better way. So in NAV 2016, we introduced extensions. And the first round was admittedly rough, and we got some great feedback, like that's a nice toy you have there and that'll never work. I don't know what you guys are trying. But we did get some very valuable feedback as well and we went forward. So in NAV 2017, we completed all of the basic object types. We had uh, most of the platform support we needed in place, but the development experience was still very rough. So in 2018, we introduced VS Code in the AL language. And this is where people really started to say, okay, I get it, I see the vision, and I can see that you're committed to this. And during all this time, when we talked about extensibility, the message was that Microsoft builds extensible code, that's something that we need to do, and we teach people how to consume it. And it was exactly what we were doing at the time, it was exactly the state of where we were at. But in April, and again this fall, we released uh, Business Central and updates to it, and now we have ISV embed solutions, where ISVs can add a vertical deep into the system that can be deployed on Business Central as extensions. And we also have pretend extensions. So you don't have to publish everything through App Source. You can do a one-off extension for a customer that they need as a VAR or the customer themselves, and they can create, modify the system kind of that last step to get it to where they need to be for them as a customer. So now, what we're here partially to say today is that we're in a world where, yes, Microsoft still needs to be world worried about extensibility, but partners also need to worry about building extensible code for others to consume. And I say this not as something you need to do, but if you look at a modified version of the slide you saw in the keynote, we have these different layers of partner customizations, and these are all in place today. Some of the other layers that, we that were talked about are still coming, but all these partner layers are already there, which means that even if you're not intending for people to build on top of your code, if you're in um, Microsoft hosted Business Central, it's very likely, quite possible, that somebody has already built a customization on top of your code. And hearing that, was that easy for that person to do on top of your code, do you think? Maybe it was, maybe not. But some examples, so we have one embed ISV live and two more by end of the year, even though this program is just in pilot. We have partner localizations live for 10 countries. We have about 150 app source extensions and within the last 60 days alone, we've received approximately 100 new ideas that partners are starting to build. And we have almost 1500 unique per tenant extensions that have been used within the last 60 days. So when we talk about people are already building on top of your code, these are the numbers we're talking about. Um, real briefly, if you haven't seen per tenant extensions yet, so in the extension management um, page, there is a new option uh, called upload extensions. And if you click on that, you can point to the .app file that you've built and upload it 
for that extension. It doesn't go through AppSource and is only available to that tenant that you're working with. The second reason that we talk a lot about extensibility is we want to create a development exp experience that's fast and easy to maintain. With source code modification, it was very powerful, but we ended up with something that looked a lot more like spaghetti. Code was interwoven. You could still have some practices that would separate things, but because of the um, tools that you had available to you, there was always some level of the spaghetti in there. And going forward, we're trying to get people to build in a, thinking about building blocks as a style. And I've talked with one partner a couple of times, um, as an example, who they made this change a couple years ago and started building everything as extensions rather than source code modification. And he said at first their consultants hated it. They were used to being able to go in, tweak any line, do whatever they want really easily, and said admittedly they had some trouble right away. They didn't know how to build extensible code. They didn't know what extension points they needed. But shortly after they got it going, they said the consultants came back and said, you are right, this is what we need to be doing. And they loved it when they could go to a customer in a pre-sale environment and start learning about the customer and what they needed. And they could, people would come in and start gathering information and they could come back or sit down with a customer and say, okay, you want this and we'll throw a couple of extensions in. Oh, and you want that functionality, we'll throw a couple more in. And some combination of, I think at their time, it was 37 extensions they had, they would throw a combination of those in, in the meeting with the customer and say, so this is basically what you want. Basically right there, they had pretty much set up the system at least with the functionality that was needed. And then they could do that last mile to enhance it on top of that. So with that in mind, I'm going to turn it over to Garrett. Thank you. So are we there yet? That's the key question, I guess. So when we talk about application extensibility, there are some questions we can ask. So how extensible is the application? How much of the app is extensible? How are we progressing on extensibility? And finally, where do we go from here? So some future aspirations. So how extensible is the application? So I'm only gonna talk about W1, but the same thing holds for every country version. Um, so you can add new objects, you can extend objects, you can call safe procedures, you can subscribe to events, you can use and extend enums, and there's a bunch more if you've probably learned here in the past two days. But that doesn't really say much about how extensible the application is. So how much of the application is extensible? So some numbers. This is the fall release, the latest one. 2,760 something integration events. Sounds like a lot. 11,000 external procedures that are safe to call in a SaaS environment. But our application is big, so we have 5,800 something objects. We can see how they're distributed uh, across the types. We have 34 something thousand procedures. We have 526,000 lines of code. So, and by the way, it's getting bigger every year. Uh, it's pretty linear actually. So does this tell us how extensible the application is? Maybe not. So 78% of objects have platform events. So this is really great. 80% you can you know, have CRUD events on insert or after, all those things. Integration events, those 2,700 events are only in 664 objects, which is roughly 12% of objects. So it doesn't look so good now. And 50% of our code is either local or internal, which means you can't access it. If you, you can slice it by, uh, by object, so 50% of objects have n nothing you can access. And in terms of code lines, half of the code lines you can't access. So how are we progressing on making the application more extensible? So we're adding events. Every release we add more events. We have a nice curve, 327 events in the next cumulative update. But external methods, we're almost done. So in the next update, we'll add 2,200 more, and you can see there's not much left. So ex external events is the yellow, uh, the uh, the blue bit, right? So we had none in October 2016, and now there's almost no global non-external methods left. So then, when will the application be extensible enough? Will it ever be extensible enough? 
Should we add more events? Should we add events in more objects, cover the entire application? Would you be able to navigate the tens of thousands of events, methods, and objects that we'll get if we continue on this path? Is it the right path? Will we ever get a fully extensible application this way? We think there's a better way. So as you saw in the keynote, this is our kind of end goal, where we want to get to. So highly componentized, extensible by partners, high quality, open source, where components can be extended, they can be replaced, they can be removed, little star there, uh, they can be added. The stars because you can't remove a component that somebody else depends on. But. So in the end, everything will be an extension. So something about componentizing the application code. The application was not designed to be code customized. So it was designed to be code customized, not to be extended. You guys all know that. So by componentizing, it will force us to redesign for extensibility. And the interface to a component should be a versioned contract that can be accessed from inside and outside Business Central. We, we don't just want people to use Business Central from within Business Central. We want to be able to connect to Business Central from the outside. It should define how you use, extend, or replace the component, which is pretty obvious. And what about the components themselves? So we have some thoughts around that. They can't be code customized. Those days are gone. You can't have circular dependencies, because that would break. They should have to be extensible by design, because otherwise they wouldn't be able to depend on each other, because there's no more code customization. They should be replaceable. They don't have to be, but they should be. And we think they should be small and manageable, but they should be big enough to provide value. And we'll put all the source code on GitHub for partners to contribute. So we don't want to do all this by ourselves. So now a dose of realism, right? Sounds like a fancy picture. This is the start of a very long journey. This will take many years. And yes, we will break your solutions along the way. And extensibility will not be automatic and it will not be free. We will have to design our components with extensibility in mind. And yes, we will make mistakes and hopefully we'll learn and then we'll move on. So where do we start? So another slide from the keynote um, on how to componentize. So componentize from the bottom. We're starting with the system layer. So what's, what is the system layer, right? It's basically the interface between the application and the platform. It's a lot of the things you know as code unit one, which hopefully you know is gone. Um, it should hold all the platformish functionality. So here's a short list. This is to be decided. We don't yet know all the things we'll put in there, but it'll be a pretty long list. And this is the place where we're going to access all the unsafe bits. And we're going to wrap it in a safe way so that you can use it. And the system layer can't be replaced. And that's exactly because it will do all the things that are unsafe in a cloud world. But we will open source it. And you will be able to contribute to it if in case we missed something. And then what? So here's a rough timeline of what we're planning to do. So separating app from platform, that's been done. That's basically when we removed code unit one. Creating a system layer, that's in progress. We're actively working on this. We're planning in planning stages for creating the app foundation layer, which will be all the horizontal features that everybody will need and want to use. And after that, the plan is, but it's very fluffy, to uh, start pulling out the, the financial module. And at some point, we'll componentize everything. So now over to Bardor for some examples. Yes. How to examples. Can you hear me? Yes, you can. So that's another thing that comes up when you look for extensions. Um, we'll take a look back in time as well. Uh, so for instance, back in time, we, we wanted to 
uh, allow users or partners to substitute our reports with others, also sort of an extension. We had uh, the report selections table that most of you know, which has a usage. And this is how the option string looks today. I don't know how if you have a love-hate relation to this one. We, 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 we do. Um, so uh, this is something we should fix, I guess. Yeah. Th that's exactly how we feel about it. So yeah, as I said, used for um, selecting which report. So the thing about an option field is that it provides programmatic validation when you compile. Right? That, that's important because, but it's, as you saw, difficult to extend. So can we fix it? First of all, there's the upgrade <coughs> issue if we fix it. So should we move it to an integer or to code? Should we hard code specific values or do we want an, an, you know, a lookup table that, that defines the usage? I don't know if you have made your, these considerations yourself. Um, or should we just wait for modern AO? I, get, I hope some of you were to the presentation yesterday on the modern AO. Um, because there we define the values in this way. And this is kind of nice and programmatic. And the same if you extend it, you simply write the new values, right? So maybe this is just what we should do. Wait for it. Um, I mean, leave it as is for now and wait for modern AO. So I think that's our plan for now. Another thing that we made some years ago was uh, the dimensions functionality. So that was also intended to be as extendable as we could think of back then. It's generic, user-defined. I mean, user can define basically anything. It should be easy for the partners to extend. The caption class functionality that some of you may or may not have used was actually introduced at the same time for this very specific purpose. Um, in case you don't know the dimension system, so this is an item. This is the default dimensions for that item, and it relates with um, a table ID and the key for the main uh, entity. And this is a pattern we then use for customers and vendors and what have you. And for transactions, so this is a sales line. It has um, a dimension set entry that points to a dimension set. And when you post it, the posted entry also points to the same. So for the ledger. Uh, and this, yeah, this is how they relate. And we, as well, have library functions. And we should also, with what I didn't show there, was we actually also, at that time, released documentation on how to do it for you developers. The caption class, um, this is an example from, I think it's a sales line or customer, or whatever it is. Um, so you can see up there, 1.2.1. And if we look here in code unit 42, caption class management, the one relates to the area, which is dimensions, to which group, so this would be the shortcut. And number one is number one. which then points to shortcut dimension number one, which again points to department where we define code caption or field caption, depending on which um, field you want to show. And as you can see here, it nicely writes department code as specified there. And the same with the other ones. And if you want to do use it in your solutions, um, this is how you could do it. Either you can hard code something there or you can 
make a function that make, makes it dynamic. So in this example, we just show a random thing. So it feels like a lottery every time you look up a customer. It's 41 here at the time when this was this picture was taken. Another less understood feature is um, auto format expression for amounts. So we have a balance. Here you can see we have type 11, which is custom. And then again, a function. It could also be a constant, by the way. But then you could just write. Um, and then you write something. So hey, something, and which then means that the number will be formatted like that. Maybe not as us useful, but it could be used for drawing attention to the number. Or, as we do s several places, we, we use it for adding the currency sign. <coughs> so, item charts. This is actually one of the first things where we designed it for the new way to extend uh, code. So when you want to, when you have an item chart and you want to distribute that on among one or more, well, don't distribute it to one, but distribute among several sales lines, you click that thing, suggest the item chart assignment, and then it suggests you different types or different methods of distribution, equally by amount or weight or volume. But it could be that you had a fifth, or maybe you want to exclude one of these. Maybe you want to change this option. So how would you do this without modifying our code? So if you look at the code that does this, so first of all, we have the, I assume you know about AL, string menu. So here we construct the string menu with different options. And here, so just, just before we show it, we call an event uh, where we pass everything in, including the um, string. So then you, or the event subscriber, can either add to the string or <coughs> remove from it or do whatever. And then we show show the string to the user, and then we call this function, which bring passes on what the user actually selected. And so this is our code. I mean, I deleted some of it there, but then we say if the user selected, you know, one of ours, then we do what we decided, or we pass it on to your event. So this is an event that you would then subscribe to. So if the user chose option number seven, you would handle option number seven and do whatever you need to do with uh, distributing the, yeah, there. So that that's, a general pattern we will, you know, we aspire to, to do. Um, Michael talked about building blocks. Also, Gert talked about uh, component componentizing the application. So we have a lot of features or building blocks that are horizontal. I mean, they're kind of generic. We have some some that are more vertical in their nature, like manufacturing and distribution and such. So how would we go about designing a new thing here? So one thing we have heard over and over um, from customers is um, subscriptions or recurring invoicing or whatever we call it. So as you can see, there are many, many examples where you use recurring invoices. I mean, if I look at my bank account, I don't know, 70 or 80% of what goes out goes to some sort of recurring payment, rent, insurance, stuff. 
So this is what your customers want or our customers. But what should we do in Microsoft? So if we extract what's generic from that, I mean, it's something about managing subscriptions, like generically, something about being able to create periodic invoices, something about changing the price up or down, something about being able to mail or send email, uh, ma some sort of notification to the customer that we are changing either price or conditions. Uh, some sort of direct debit, because if you have many subscriptions, you would probably sign up with, I don't know, credit card or some sort of automatic bank transfer. So if we look at how such a subscription system, I mean, from our point of view, could look like. So let's say that the end goal is that we want, as is the sales invoice, so that's what we want, and how do we then get there. So we have a customer and we have some sorts of subscriptions here, right? So this guy can select from it some of these. So I added Jim Basic there. And then he can sign up for it. It means that he gets assigned a Jim subscription. And then we have a batch job that can generate periodically um, an invoice from that. So this is basically what you already have, or almost, with the so-called recurring sales lines and standard sales lines, if you are familiar with it. But we need more, right? So we need some sort of Recurrence. So what I drew up there is um, maybe it's difficult to see from you are where you are, but this is the recurrence you can select in Outlook's recurrence when you uh, want to set up a meeting. Right there, you can see do it you know, daily, weekly, every other week, last Thursday of the month, whatever. And we actually are have this in the works, I mean, in the lab, um, to do something similar for NAV, because it has been a frequent ask for the job, job queue, for instance, to have a recurrence you can set that is more meaningful than just minutes. Um, so that's something we should be able to do, connect a recurrence object to customer subscription. We also want uh, conditions, so terms and conditions, it, it could be as simple as a Word document, you know, just some attachment that can be generic to the subscription and then is passed on to the customer because it could be that the customer gets a different condition than the default one. We also want to be able to adjust prices, both our, I mean, the announced prices or the price list, if you will, or the individual customers. And this is probably something that would be heavily extended because, um, I mean, like prepayments. So if they're prepaid, you probably also need to adjust the prepaid amount. There are a lot of um, difficult things there. We also want to be able to send um, the letter to the customer to advise them. Uh, before we send out the invoices, uh, we probably also want to be able to verify that the totals, right? We want to be able to, you know, run reports ensuring that we are um, collecting the exact correct money we want to, so we don't overcharge or undercharge. And also some sort of payment integration. So what I just showed is what we aspire to do, but your customer, I mean, our customer, viewer, need more. So as I said, this is a table, right? And you'll be able to extend with code and fields and whatever. 
same on the customer um, subscription <coughs> because if you subscribe to an insurance there might be all sorts of insurance specific things right versus a gym or something else um, you would certainly want to adjust or change how we calculate prices. You certainly also want to change how we collect um, or generate the invoices and how we, uh, which report to run. It could be as simple as report selection, so we can add yet an option to that string from before. Maybe two options even. Uh, we could use custom word layouts, which is an existing way of extending. Or you can substitute, so as Gert said, uh, not only extend our stuff, but substitute our stuff. So that's what this would be. You can, in this example, as I mentioned, that maybe you don't want to go through uh, sales documents and then posting sales documents. I mean, if you have a, s a th simple thing like um, a gym membership or a music subscription, then why would you go through creating a sales invoice and post a sales invoice, which is expensive? Maybe you want to go directly to customer gen uh, lead entries, just do a journal posting. So that's how we imagine creating the subscriptions. I mean, this is something we are working on as we speak. Um, so this is example one. Another thing that um, Her talked about as well was um, separating out, uh, I mean, we'll start from the bottom layer, so we'll separate the GL from the rest. And to do that, we need first we need to remove dependencies, right? So if you look at the general ledger table or GL entry table, we have things like production order. Well, I mean, why do we do that? Fixed asset stuff um, and some system things. There are also the hidden dependencies. I mean. Why would a customer ledger entry inherit its entry number from GL entry number? That makes it difficult to make what, make what we had in the previous example. Maybe you want to create a num lot of customer ledger entries and then collapse them all into one set of GL entries. So in your account, you wouldn't say, you know, membership for <coughs> customer A, customer B, but just um, December months membership fees, right? So again, the general journal, it needs to be general, right? Today it's not real general. You can't post items with it, right? Um, but also, you already today you can post to things that, you know, if you look at the bottom layer of the general ledger, um, that if you only look at the bottom layer, you wouldn't know about items or customers or fixed assets or whatever. So we need to be able to extend it to any sub-ledger. And so assume or think of a general ledger as a true general ledger or journal that can take any type and extendable to any type, then when you post such a thing with whatever types it has, think of this batch as a bag, a property bag if you're thinking programming terms or just a bag of things, and then you pass it on to each subsystem like inventory, debitor, creditor, insurance, leasing, whatever system you might have. In your and then each sub-ledger could you know, handle their records or their journal lines in that batch and replace it with 
either you know GL or if it's further up the chain, like if it's some manufacturing, it would probably know about items, right? So it could substitute its journal lines with item journals, and then eventually it only it would only contain GL journal lines, and then it would be posted to the finance. So, I mean, this is what we aspire to. So it's hot air until now, right? Yeah, so that I think this concludes the examples of from the applications. Then we'll talk about, about upgrade. Or Michael will. Yes, I will. So once we've started building a system where we have many extensions and the extensions are all interacting, we need to figure out how to upgrade all these pieces together. We obviously want, if you've got something working, when you go to the next version, we want it to keep working. And there's some um, patterns that we've seen or some things that we think uh, people might not be aware of yet that we want to call out here to help start this journey. So I'm going to start out with showing what's available in upgrade code units and extensions. So we have six functions. Um, there's per database and per uh, company copies of three different uh, triggers. And the, I'll start with the middle one, on upgrade per database. That is where your upgrade code goes. That one's pretty straightforward. Um, people understand how to use that one. It's the other two where we get a little bit of questions and some confusion about what their intent is. So the first one, on check preconditions, this is something where, and, and I'll talk about this a little bit more on the next couple slides, but you're able to check before you start a lengthy upgrade process. If you have a lot of data, it can take quite a bit of time. You don't want to get to the last record of um, five million records and fail on something that could have been detected in um, milliseconds or a couple of seconds right away. If there's a way to detect early some condition that you know is true, um, do that right away. Find out if it's going to be a problem before you start going through expensive upgrade operations and fail fast, allow somebody to fix the data, and then try the upgrade again. The last one, on validate upgrade, if in the context of upgrading a single extension is probably not really useful. Um, again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about upgrading multiple pieces at one time. But when that happens, you may want to make sure that something that happened during an upgrade you were involved in still holds true once all the pieces finish upgrading. If there are uh, conditions like that that you need to check, things that you're worried about, this is where you put that logic. And all of these triggers, all three of them, operate within a single transaction. So if you find something that's wrong, you can throw an error, it will roll the whole transaction back again. Again, that's part of why we want to try to find easily identifiable problems upfront in the check preconditions so that we can fail quick, we don't have to keep that long transaction open, it doesn't take all that time, we don't have to spend the rollback time. Um, it's a lot easier on the system and a lot more um, effective for users to deal with. So now that we've talked about components, um, how do we upgrade these components together? So the way it's typically done right now, and in the examples I'm giving, right now, the, today the base application is written in CAL, Seaside, but as we've talked, eventually this could become one extension, multiple extensions. It, it really doesn't matter for these examples, but I I'm just want to call that out. So what we do today is we tend to upgrade each piece. Um, when it succeeds, then we go on to the next one. We can still do these in one process through set of calls, but we're essentially doing one at a time. So go through the base, do its check preconditions, do its upgrade, do its validate, then take the first extension and run all of its pieces. The way that we are moving towards internally, and we want to promote more um, externally, is that these processes can actually be interwoven. Um, it, as long as you uh, don't have too big of a transaction with your upgrade code that it overfills the transaction buffer, you can run all of these in one single transaction. That means that we call all of the check preconditions first. So we'll call the check preconditions for base, for your extension, for my extension, for Geert's extension, and if any one of those finds an upfront error, it stops. If no errors are found, we go on to the upgrade step, and we'll call the upgrade code for all of these extensions so that we, we run them all. And you can start to get to see why the 
check preconditions is valuable up front. If I'm the 70th extension in line in a single upgrade process and I don't accept uh, blanks or defaults in a certain column, I need something specific for the upgrade logic I have. If I check that right away, I haven't run through the first 69 extensions then at that point before my extension fails its upgrade. We can, again, fail fast, find right away. And then with those multiple pieces that we talked about, we may have some logic that we need to validate when it's done. Did another extension touch a, maybe I'm uh, integrating to a base table. If I'm integrating to customer and I'm changing some of the data in customer so that it works with my application, I wanna make sure that another extension didn't come along and reset the values or change it to values that are no longer valid. So then we start to get into scenarios where how do I know what's actually happening? How do I know if I'm upgrading, if somebody else is upgrading? I've got events that I've hooked up through all the system. If I'm subscribed to an event on the customer table, when the customer fires, is it because a user's in the system or because somebody's upgrading the customer table? I may not care during upgrade, I may go back and fix it later. Um, I may just wanna wait until the whole upgrade is done so I can uh, fix everything once instead of constantly interacting on every record, um, slowing things down, doing a lot of extra logic and processing. So the first piece we have is the execution context API. Um, the execution context is an option field uh, with normal install and upgrade, pretty straightforward. And we have a couple of different usages available. You can call into session.executionContext. That will tell you what's going on in the system as a whole. If any extension is installing or anybody is doing an upgrade, those will be set appropriately. If none of that's happen, happening, execution will be normal. Then the next one is, what's happening with my extension? So I can use the get current module extension context, execution context, and find out if the execution context is upgrade, am I actually upgrading or is somebody else upgrading? Where am I in relation to this? And on the previous slide where I showed how these are all happening um, at the same time with, or within that step, this will be the one whose upgrade is currently being executed. So you can be queued for an upgrade in that set, but um, the execution context will tell you which uh, um, extension or base is currently doing the upgrade. And then if you have dependencies and you wanna know, is your dependency upgrading or is another extension that I'm aware of upgrading, doing an install, you can look up a specific one by calling the get module execution context and passing in the module ID, that's the app ID in the app.json file, um, pass that in to get the context of a specific extension that you want to know about. The second piece to this is the module API. So there's a couple of pieces to this, but this basically allows you to get information about an extension. So again, get current module info, will get information about your extension, the one that your code is authored in, or you can look up information for a, another specific extension. Um, this will give you the ID, the name, um, the publisher, things that you said in the app JSON, um, the versions, and the, any dependencies that you have or the module has. So the, probably the most common way this gets used is with the app version and data version, um, both on install and upgrade. So on install, if it's installed for the first time, it's never been on the system, the data version will be zero because there's no data there. If the app has been uninstalled, and then you install the same version again, the data version will match the app version because you're putting on the same version of what's already there. So you can use that in your install code as well. On an upgrade then, you can tell which version you're coming from. Um, if you're going to version 16 of your extension and the data version is two, maybe you don't support an upgrade path there. That's something that you can check and find out. Is this um, something, some data that I actually can upgrade, something I know about? Do you have different upgrade logic depending on which version you're coming from? I already converted something going from three to four, so if I'm going from four to five, I don't need to convert that data a second time. But if I'm coming from three to five, that data hasn't been had that first round of conversion yet, so I need to handle that case as well. So a quick example of checking the context, uh, basically like I talked about. So we've got um, two variables of execution context. Um, I'm just calling, first of all, get the execution context. That's the one for the entire system. 
Um, and then I'm getting my local context. That's for my current extension. And then just a quick check to see if the system is in an upgrade, but my extension is not upgrading, then in this example, I'm just going to exit. This is not logic that I need to worry about when somebody else is running an, an upgrade. And if I'm not in an upgrade, or it is my extension that's doing the upgrade, then I have some code that I want to execute here. So pretty basic example. Um, we've also talked about being able to attribute event subscribers, um, something we'd like to add so that you don't have to write all this boilerplate code. But we haven't uh, plugged this into everything yet because there's different situations depending on what your code is doing, depending on what's happening in the system. Uh, right now, it's something that you will need to actually write the code to go do, but hopefully we can make this a little bit easier going forward. So a couple of other considerations, um, and these are things that people get uh, tripped up a little bit on So sometimes. I talked a little bit about versions don't need to be applied in sequence. So you can upgrade from 1 to 2 to 3, but I can also upgrade from 1 to 3. And that's up to the extension to do those checks for is it a version path that you support in your extension. Um, obviously, going from 1 to 3 is a lot easier for the user. They don't need multiple steps. Um, it just means that your code has to account for that situation. And at some point, you'll probably get to a point to where you're several versions back, and maybe it's not worth uh, maintaining that upgrade going forward. All your users are off of that version. Um, extensions can be uninstalled prior to an upgrade being invoked. I talked about uninstalling and then reinstalling it. In my previous example, I can also uninstall v1. Maybe there's a breaking change that we Microsoft introduced um, when something came out, and it's a non-critical extension. It was useful, helpful, um, had some nice functionality, but you want the user upgraded and you can go without the extension for a little while. So you uninstall that extension. And then once you've had time to modify the code to work with that breaking change, you want to put the new upgraded version back on the system. So an upgrade gets invoked and that's where you're going from one to three. Um, in both install and upgrade cases, if the extension was on the system previously, if you have table extension objects, uh, with the companion tables, we make sure that there's default values in the companion table for every record in the base table. So if defaults are okay, there's nothing specifically that you need to do. But if you need more than that, um, if you're getting either reinstalled or upgraded from an uninstall, you might need to check some of those values again um, to make sure that they're valid because the system ran for a while with your extension not present. So there may be some data that needs to be cleaned up. Um, when I talked about those serial upgrades before, um, and in general in extensions, commit is ignored. We don't want somebody to end up in a situation where an upgrade fails, it rolls half back, and then they can either work with a new extension because the upgrade failed, but they can't work with the old extension because the ex uh, upgrade partially uh, completed, committed some of its data. So maybe that data no longer works with the previous version. So if you write a commit during an upgrade, we will ignore that. Um, also, we recommend avoiding external calls during upgrade. We recommend handling these after the upgrade because um, you don't want to be start making external web service calls during your upgrade, have a network connectivity spike, um, not be able to complete, and it rolls your entire upgrade back. Um, basically, just try to do the minimum you need to in your upgrade and clean up the rest um, at, in a post-upgrade step. Obviously, you want to do the upgrade of the data. Do that, but um, try to avoid things like external calls if you can help it. A um, couple things to know about schema. This is uh, the modifications to tables. Once you've added a table currently, we only allow additive changes. We don't support destructive changes. So this means you can't remove fields or keys, you cannot rename fields or keys, and you cannot change data types. Um, this is pretty restrictive and it's a change that takes some getting used to, but it's a pattern that we're working with internally. Um, and we've kind of learned to deal with it and it makes you think a little more upfront about what you're gonna change going forward. So once you can't do this, y you run into all kinds of problems right away. How do you start to work around this? And the way we do that is with the obsolete state property. This allows you to signal that fields are going to be removed going forward. And there's uh, three values for this, uh, normal, pending, and um, I forget the last one, but basically it's that it's no longer able to be used. So what we recommend is set it, if you're, uh, the example we use to demonstrate usage of this a lot, 
is I started out with a name field in my table. And I want to change from name to first name, last name. But how do I do that if I can't get rid of the name field? So we recommend um, turning name into, or setting the obsolete state pending, first of all. And then adding the first name and last name fields to the table. And the new logic should work there. You probably hide name from the UI, but name is still present in that table. It can still be read from, it can still be written to. And then you'll want to handle any rights to name to split name into first and last name as they're being written. And try to maintain both of those fields for a period of time. We recommend at least one major update um, is what we try to do internally so that people have time to react if they've built on top of that. It's, there's nothing worse than coming into work one day and finding out, oh, everything's broken, it doesn't work anymore. Giving people a little bit of leeway with that helps everybody out in the long run. And then once you no longer, once you've given them a window, you can change the obsolete state to hide the field and remove it. And even though that still exists in the table, it um, cannot be written to, the platform blocks that. It can only be read from in upgrade code um, so that you can still move values out of it if you need to. Um, and then going forward, we are working away on a way to enable the actual schema removal. This is not something we have yet. This is something that's impacting us as well, Microsoft. This applies to all extensions. Um, it's on our backlog coming soon um, with a way of how to actually then remove the field from the object and from the SQL schema. So finally, what have we talked about here? Um, and we titled this, Join Us on Our Journey Intentionally. This is not something that we want to force on everybody for change sake, um, but we believe that extensibility is important. It's going to be more important. We've been saying this for a few years now. And wants you to be involved with this, as we talked about at the beginning. Uh, people are building on top of your code as well. It's no longer that Microsoft's code isn't extensible. We realize we've still got work to do, but you're going to start building on other partners' code. People are going to start building on your code. So come along with us. Um, we'll share things that we're learning. Please share things that you're learning. So when you're writing your code, start thinking about how would other people extend my code? Where are they going to tie into it? What functionality might, types of functionality might they add to it? Um, and start, you know, if you know of people that are building on your code, go to them for feedback. What are they doing with your code today? What are they going to want to do once your code is in extensions? And then start writing extensible code where you can. Things like uh, Bardur sh showed with, when you have a switch statement, the default was to call an event. The default was no longer to throw an error. Because if you're throwing an error in a switch statement, there's no way anybody can get in there to add a new case that they want to add that wasn't in your initial design. Um, practice writing safe upgrade code. Be aware that there's other extensions on the system, that other code is executing in the same uh, upgrade transaction with you. Unfortunately, as Gert said, prepare to be broken. This is going to be a transition. W our goal is to do this once and do it right. So it will be a little bit painful at times as we go through this. We'll try to minimize it and keep it um, as easy as we can. But there will be times where we will break your code. Um, and last of all, most importantly, we believe, give us feedback. When we started extensions a couple years ago, like I said, the initial response was not overwhelmingly positive. People, some people saw where we were going and were excited, but a lot of people weren't real um, on board with what we delivered in that first release. But we got a lot of feedback, and we took that into the new development tools. We've gotten a lot of feedback there. We've changed the way we solicit feedback for that. And that iterative approach has helped us develop something better develop something you use, and as we're, we're changing the way we interact with the community, we can deliver changes faster. This is also a unique time in this product. A lot of the changes that have come down in the past have been worked on for three years, then delivered, and then you were stuck with it. We can make little changes, but there wasn't a lot of things we could do. We're starting on this journey. We've obviously had extensions for a little while, but the application refactoring is just starting. So if you have feedback, if you're actively involved as we're going through this, getting the early builds, um, if you've seen some of the other sessions about where to get the Docker drops that are coming, as you're getting that stuff, try them out, provide feedback, let us know. This is an opportunity for you to be involved and get something that works um, best for the community, for everybody, for the product longevity going forward. 10 years from now, it's gonna be hard to go back and change what we do on the system layer. And then contribute to the GitHub repositories. So 
the last slide um, is a bunch of resources, but you'll notice several of these are GitHub repositories. So the first one is the development tools, um, the OpenCAL library where you can interact with .NET. Um, that it, once we approve that, that'll go into the base application. Um, AL application extensions. We're starting to share our extension code publicly, both so you can see them and see what we're doing and also so that you can contribute back to them. Um, and then, so those are the places that we recommend right now to get involved with seeing what we're doing. Um, we're very active on those sites. So if you're active there, you should get feedback in it within a couple of days generally. Um, extension requirements. Um, you can go there to see what, what it takes to build an extension to put on Business Central and the Microsoft Cloud. And the Ready to Go program is another place to go look at some of the documentation to get started. Find out uh, what you need to do for building extensions. So I don't know how we are for time. Hopefully we're okay. But I think we're, we have <laughs> plenty of time for questions. So. You go you throw the box over Should there. I? But there's already one there, right? Hmm? Where? Ah, second row. You can have these t-shirts. Blue and black. Thank you. Uh, are the subscriptions already on the roadmap? Will they be in the spring release, maybe? So that question is not strictly tied to extensions, but uh, something we are working on. So whether we get it for spring or not is not a promise, but we are working. Thanks. There's a gentleman here. So at the moment, when you deploy extensions to the sandbox, the same checks aren't carried out as when you deploy them to production? Is that intentional or? Can you? So, I, I, so I've been able to okay. deploy via, via VS Code and it was happy. Use the upload extension. I get an error because someone's missed the application area or something. So. Um, are you talking about when you're deploying it to production, are you deploying it at, from app source or as a per tenant extension? Uh, as a tenant extension. Okay. So the reason we do that is you can develop both app source and per tenant extensions in the sandbox. So we've basically taken the least restrictive set to put on there. Um, so when you deploy per tenant, there's a couple other things we check. If you, um, in VS Code, there's now code analysis that you yeah. can run and you can use the per tenant cop. We'll give you locally when you build that. Um, same checks that would do when you deploy it to production. Uh, small suggestion on the uh, ordering or, or the triggers on the app, uh, the upgrade code units. Could you add one that it also validates after a single extension? I can understand that you want to check everything, that it doesn't roll back halfway all of a sudden, but if you're only going to validate at the bottom of everything, I think there could be some checks in front of that, preventing to roll back after my extension is wrong already. Yep. Yeah, I think you could do that. You could also do that um, in the upgrade itself. Yeah, so we, we could add that trigger there. I think that would be better. Yep. Should have me here. Even though it's just strictly was the question. Right? Broken. <laughs> yes, I will repeat the question. Um, so the question was when you have multiple extensions upgrading, do they always upgrade in the same order? And I believe the answer is yes. Your next question is going to be what order do they upgrade in? And we don't guarantee an order. So <laughs> I, I believe it, it, you, there is an order, but we reserve the right to change how that order is calculated. And um, we do respect dependency order, though. So if you have a dependency on another extension and they're upgrading at the same time, the one that you have a dependency on will do its upgrade before your upgrade happens. Yeah, so, so the question is, um, the suggestions for GitHub, whether it's only for W1 or all countries or all versions, and obviously it's for all versions. And we'll actually also, 
encourage you to do so because it's typically the same, I don't know, five, ten people who are active there, which is not much. So I would, I mean, there are hundreds in here, so please do. On the list. But I, I think there was a guy up there first. One minute. Report extensions. Report extensions. Hmm. Yeah, so, so maybe report, extension, report extensions is something we've talked about, um, haven't done yet. So right now you can replace the layout, um, but we would like to make it so that you can extend the data set would be the part that we would allow on a report extension. So it's something that's on our radar. Um, we just haven't implemented it yet. Thanks. <laughs> um, yesterday, um, um, your colleagues, they told us that uh, there are requirements in order to upload uh, an extension to AppSource. And you showed, uh, you showed the link where we can check those extensions. Uh, the thing that I want to ask is, um, one of the requirements is that we have translation, so we have XLIF file. But I think that they said that the XLIF file includes only the captions. What about the text constants and the other things, like labels or? So the XLIF file is just for translations, right? So I don't, I don't know exactly how the format is, but you put your normal captions in using the label tag, right? I and then so, in yes. the XLIF, you get a reference to the label and then that's what yep. you translate. Yep. Okay. Uh, on the side. I'll go, I'll go with the microphone over there, it's okay. Ah. Hi. Um, I was interested in the um, roadmap for extensionizing the application. Uh, we've got um, a, a vertical which integrates the inventory module heavily, but we find it very difficult to make this vertical work without modifying the source code of the inventory module and in certain cases, just a lot to do with reservations. Uh, where on the roadmap is a rework of the inventory module and at what point will the source code be locked down so that we can't actually uh, correct the issues that we find with it? It's a, it's a very good question. It's on the bit of the roadmap we haven't looked at yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's too far ahead in the future to, to say anything ab ab about that. Um, so it, the way we're doing it is, so we're, we're taking things out of basically the bottom layers Right, and those, those were building them as separate components, extensions, um, and then refactoring the base app to use those new components. And so we'll go up through the stack. But at the same time, I think you know you can you can continue with what you're doing today until you know the inventory module, probably multiple modules, get pulled out, and then give us feedback, obviously. But the idea is that, that by then, the, the system should, you should be able to take the component, which is open sourced, change its code, and republish it as your own. So in that sense, you will still be able to code customize, but if you do, then you take responsibility for the entire component. So th that's kind of the plan, but w when, when will this happen? You know, one year, two years, five years, I have no idea. You hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, you were saying that we should um, expect bre potentially breaking changes every six months. So uh, what is your concept to prepare the partners with ISV solutions? Are there going to be early builds that we can check our solutions on or what's, what's your concept on this? 
So as far as I know, it's, it's the same as we have today. So we have Docker images uh, every, every build, every day at least? I, I think it's that you can uh, get at access least to. every week, I think every day. Yeah. So you can go see the latest daily or weekly build right now. Okay, so those are not the official builds yet, so we have more or less an early build. We can check our stuff yep. on, and then it's going to push to the real customers eventually. Yep. yep. Okay, thank you. I mean, that's basically how you can look over our shoulder, right, to see what we're doing. Just take a Docker build every day or every week. Then you can see what we're doing. Ah, sorry. Thank you. I've had an open uh, GitHub issue with regard to amending indexes. So in the slide it was indicated we can't change indexes, yep. which is uh, an issue because the indexes have some index fields, they have to maintain um, SIF index, maintain, uh, not maintain the SQL index, so, uh, and the ability to add new indexes. Yep. So, so you can add new indexes. Okay. That's supported. So the reason we don't allow you to change indexes is because um, I internal backings of what we do when we host, we can actually host multiple tenants um, in the same, data or same database, and they can have different versions of the same extension installed. So if you have um, V2 and V3 of your extension installed in different tenants but on the same database, then if they have different indexes, we can no longer keep that table together if all the indexes maintain the same, and that's why we don't delete fields right now currently as well, is because it, it's basically the common denominator of what's there is what's actually in SQL. Different tenants just see different portions of the table okay. based on what they have installed. And that's where why if you change an index, then we can't keep that table together anymore. Right, I'm more concerned about the VSIF enabling yep. and changes from the base application. Like an example, being content entry into the uh, warehouse ledger entry is turned off by default, which okay. is a big performance hit yep. uh, in a warehouse. So that needs to be able to be changed by an extension. It cannot be. Okay. Or you could ask us to do that as by default, right? We'll turn them on all by default and then we give you the ability to, in a separate way, to turn them off. Because we do index tuning. Yeah. Yep. Okay, the, 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 the product breadth is wide and so therefore the maintenance of those some indexes by some clients is unnecessary in their hot tables. Yep. Right, maybe it's a question for Mike. W would it be possible to make per tenant indexing? Well, so in, um, in Microsoft Host, so this is probably not something you'll be able to do. We've talked about ways to do it on-prem. And if you're on-prem right now, th the easiest way to do it, um, if it's in the base application, is just go change it in the base application right now. And kind of support. Yep. Extension. Yep. Exactly. So, and this is a, a problem we're aware of. We, we know about it. We're working on it. But that's what I would do in the short term until we have a solution. Is just go do it in the base app if you're on prem right now. Okay. So, do you think that this would be addressed by the, the spring release? Um, I honestly don't know if it's on that team's spring release or not. It is very important, right? Yep. And I completely agree that it's important. So I just I just uh, I can't commit to it because I don't know where where that in their backlog. I am from end user company and we are running NAV in 25 countries and none of those countries is available at the moment on the business central. Mm -hmm. So these are more exotic countries I would say. Do you think that with this approach we are going to see viable localizations in our lifetime? Um, yes. <laughs> and, and so I'll say two things about that. Number one, we're, we've been increasing our the number of localizations that Microsoft provides out of the box. Um, as I said in one of my slides, we also have 10 partner-based localizations that have come online, I think all of them within the last six months. So if, if you want to build a localization or talk to Microsoft, um, the one link that I had, um, Get Started With Apps, um, I believe has a link for building localization apps, what's required, who to contact. So you can go there and find out more information if there's one you're looking for specifically or one that you want to build and provide. Thank you. Yep. I have a, I have a question also. You said it would be possible to replace your components, but if we do that, would uh, other extensions still be able to use our new component just as if it was yours? If you fulfill yep. the same contract. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, uh, there's very interesting things that go on when you start thinking about replacement. So I'll just uh, 
go off in dreamland for a little bit, right? So, um, so currently you can't replace any component because if you have a dependency, it's hard linked to some GUID and if it's different GUID, even if it's the exact same code, it's broken. So number one, fix that. Uh, if you think about you know, replacing a little bit more extensively, so imagine, so the bad example, but it's, a, it's an easy one, right? So locations, locations today, it's a code field, right? And then there's a bunch of stuff behind it. Imagine I wanted my locations to be longitude and latitude. What do I do? I can add extra fields and then wherever I go, I can go use those two fields and have some table relation, and do all sorts of magic. But if in my component, I could decide what I think a location is, is longitude, longitude and latitude. And when you put that on a card page, you show map. And if you put it on a list page, you show coordinates. And if you use it here, do that. And so that's all defined within the component. Uh, and anybody who depends on me doesn't say, here's how, they just say, I want to use location. They don't say how to use it. They don't say what to do. They just go put location here. When I go in and I rip out the location and I put in my new you know, latitude and longitude location, everything should just light up everywhere. That's kind of like the really long-term dream. So that requires every component to define uh, a very strong contract, say exactly, here's what I allow you to do. If you want to extend me, here are the things you are allowed to do. If you want to replace me, here are the things you have to provide that other people have used, right? And so if we have that, and it's probably, you know, we'll navify it, right? It'll probably be new object type, type contract, blah, blah. Um, then we could start to do, you know, very interesting thing with, uh, with replacement. As I said, far into the future. But it is being discussed and thought about, and, you know, how would we do this? It would be the same as in .NET or yep. in C Sharp that you would have to implement an, an interface, right? Yeah. So, I think we had a question there. I'll see if we can speak. Um, hello. Out. Um, I was just wondering, are there any special memory considerations when you're working with extensions? So memory considerations? So, uh, if you have more extensions, you would need more memory? Um, slightly. It's not significant um, because it's basically similar to creating um, objects in Seaside right now. Uh, creating an object in one or the other, uh, once it gets to the platform at one time, they're indistinguishable from each other where they came from. Um, obviously, if you create a lot of extension objects, um, it, it will be more memory, but it's not significant compared to actually running the system with the data, just the amount of data that's there and being cached. So it's, it's pretty negligible. So we, um, I should say right now, we do have a couple issues currently with if you build very large extensions. And by very large, you'll start to see some performance on when you have five um, from VS Code. I think when you get up to two to 4,000, somewhere in that range. And if you get to tens or hundreds of thousands of objects in your extension, I, I don't know why you put 100,000 objects in one extension, but you might want to. Um, then you get into some real issues, but we're working on that right now. Uh, fixes available in the spring, hopefully for that. So, but th that's simply just deploying the extension with, like I said, 100,000 objects. Uh, once it's running, it's the same as creating objects in Seaside. You had a guy here? Yeah, you talked about uh, code that can be triggered during installation or upgrade, uh, but not during an installation. Is there a specific reason why it's not possible to trigger code at that point, or am I missing a possibility? No, um, we actually get that a lot, and there's a couple of reasons we don't do that. Um, number one is, would you want your code triggered before or after your extension is uninstalled? And if you say after, because you want to make sure that the uninstall actually completed, how do we run your uninstall code after your code has been removed? Um, th th that's the big reason, or one of the big reasons. So that's the technical reason. The second reason is we don't want um, people when you try to uninstall your extension, to put in, nope, my extension's really good, you really want it, error. You can't get rid of my <laughs> extension. I mean, that's obviously a path that probably won't happen, but if you have a bug, nobody writes bugs, but if you have a bug that throws an error, then you can't get rid of the, ins ex 
rid of the extension, so how do you fix it from that point? So until we have satisfactory answers to both of those, we don't have our install code. Oh, yep, there's a thing over here. One more question about replacing components. I know it's far in the future, but what is your idea? Do you expect people to rebuild everything from scratch or use your AL code and do kind of like code mo modifications and then replace your components? Or what is your idea or your expectation on that? Both, I guess. I mean, one thing is you could, in the case of location, you can completely change it. Or you can take whatever we have and do your tweaks and then put it back. I mean, so you, you at that current point of time, you're open for both, right? Yes. The, the idea is to look into both directions. Sorry? The, yes. The idea is to look into both directions. Both yes. You should be able to enhance, yeah, yeah. Um, in, our in the example, you should be able to enha both enhance location, or if it's completely not what you want, you want something completely different, you should be able to put in a new component. Um, similar to interfaces in .NET. If you have an implementation of an interface, I can take out that implementation, put in a new one, and use that instead. Okay, thanks. Yep. Before you replace the components, though, I, I hope you would consider, you know, going to GitHub, changing the code, doing pull requests, getting it accepted, helping everybody else before you decide, nope, my thing's so special, nobody else can see what I'm doing. But we should allow both. Yeah. This guy up there. So uh, <laughs> I was just wondering if there was a time frame on the removing fields I, from tables. I, I don't have a okay. time frame on it. It's, it's in the backlog, um, prioritized against other work. Okay. Um, because right now, the, the problems with leaving it there for now are that you have extra schema sitting around that nobody actually uses, never gets queried. Um, and you have it, unfortunately, in your AL code. But other than that, there's no impact on the system. So it's... Okay. When we look at some of the other situations where we got things that are a little more pressing, it's, I, I don't want to say it's pushed off the radar, but it's a little bit lower than some of the other things we have going on right now. So what, how do you, um, can you unenable effectively the fields is what I was getting. Yeah. Yep, so if you, if you don't want anybody to be able to use it, you set the um, uh, obsolete, uh, obsolete state, I think, um, to uh, removed, I believe, is the value. Okay. So, and, and once you've done that, the only place that field can be um, read or written to is in upgrade code. And that doesn't affect the records, look from the object size. Correct. It, so if you look at, if you get a record of that table then in your normal code, um, the field isn't there. Okay. So it can't be accessed. Okay. A bit too over here. Uh, yeah, but I think the guy with the microphone would be also. faster. Yeah, sorry, I just got one more. Uh, are you going to provide a payment model for the app source? So you can, uh, so, that, so we don't have to do that ourselves with the customers? We are trying to get the app source team to implement that. And it seems like every time we ask them, it's six months out. And we've been asking them for three years now, and it's always six months out. So I would like to tell you that, yes, it will be here immediately. Um, we're, uh, unfortunately, that's a team that we don't own control. Um, they know we want it. We keep telling them we want it. It's just a matter of when they'll actually give it to us. And I know that's not the answer you want, but unfortunately that's the best answer I can give. If you, if you want to do a uh, customization to another partner's uh, app, how can you uh, see the extension that they have installed the, the source code that they made is will, will there be an opportunity to uh, export the uh, the extension that they made so this leads into my favorite question is for three four years now when I've been talking about extensions um, it's died down a little bit but the first question I usually get is how do I look into another uh, or a variation of it? how do I look into somebody else's code so I can debug it build on it uh, something like that the second question we get is, how do I keep people from seeing my code? 
I'm, I'm not sure how to resolve <laughs> those two, but I'll, I'll tell you what we've done and you can tell me if it's good enough. So you can always build on top of another partner's extension. Um, in the app.json, there's a dependencies array. Um, just put the app, their, the GUID for their app ID in there. And then when you download symbols, like you download our platform symbols in VS Code, it will download the symbols for their extension as well if it's installed to an environment you have. Once you have that, you always get access to their metadata. So you can see their tables and fields, um, you can see their, their pages and the controls that are on them, you can see their uh, code units and the stuff that's global there. You don't necessarily get access to see their code though. There's a value in the app.json called show my code and that's up to you as a developer whether you set that to true or false. If it's true, then like we've, uh, you've probably seen some of the other sessions, like when you use F12 or you're debugging through code and you can go into the base application Microsoft code, if show my code is set to true, you can see their code in all those places as well. If they set that to false, you'll basically go to the definition and it will step over their code. You won't be able to see the code, but you'll still be able to see the procedure declaration or whatever you're going into. Okay, but if you, um get a new client and they have an um, extension from another um, partner, yep. then, then the client is blindsided because they don't have the extension from the previous partner. Right, so you can build on top of that, um, but you can't um, get that extension. Now, it, it also depends, um, ho hopefully the customer had uh, either the code for that or otherwise, it, it's the same thing, if, if they had a that's up to the purchase agreement that they had with the previous partner, whether or not they got the code for it. And that's something that's really between customers and partners and we can't step in and tell you what you have to do with your code or how you have to sell it. And so. I'm on the left. Where? Oh. You're getting your exercise today. I like seeing him run away. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah. Hi, it's on. So the show my code dilemma, I think is one we've all faced up to. Yep. Um, one of the best suggestions I heard was actually to move it so it's a property on the object. Okay. So effectively you could hide, if you have a licensing code unit, you could hide the code within that and protect it. But actually I'd like to publish the majority of my code so other people can work with it yep. in, a, in a friendly manner. Right. Um, but it, having it at the extension level is just, too black and white, why can't we move that down into tables, code units? Yep, no, I, so I, I don't think we would move it, I think we would add it there as well, so you could set a global one and then set on a parameter to override the global, but I, I, that's a good idea. There's a question up here. Um, I have the possibility to developing an extension with different cumulative update, for example, I am in my developing machine and I receive 10 and my customer I receive five in on on-premise uh, installation. Okay, so you're trying to develop for a different update than what you have code for? Yes. Okay. So we, we actually- We need to create two extension. Yep. Two version of the same extension. Okay. Oh, two versions, okay. So if you actually need two versions, then if, if there's differences between the CUs that you're coding against, um, you would need to create the two spe specific ones, um, coding against those different environments based on the changes that are there. If you can write one set of code to work against both, um, the contracts haven't changed that you're coding against, you can code against the lowest one and then it will still work on the later one as long as there were no breaking changes. Also, I think we changed modern dev. It was hard coded before against the app and platform version, and we relaxed that to just be the major minor portion of it. <coughs> so you, in that case, you'd actually be able to code against the CU10 and deploy it against CU5, again, as long as there were no breaking changes. Okay. Oh, we're in front, two in front. How many left? Uh, very quick question one. Oh, sorry. Whoops. <coughs> okay. So, uh, is there any reason why we cannot republish, uh, actually reinstall a 
an application, a tenant application on the BC Lite. Because we have a customer on BC Online and we install the version of extension, then we uninstall it. When we try to install it again, it asks us to upversion it. Any um, reason for that? So it, it's the same package, it's not, there were no changes to it made. Um, it exactly. should be able to be reinstalled then. Um, so let's talk afterwards, I'll get your information and we'll figure out why that's not working. Okay, it, that should work, so. Okay, good. Maybe I'll just do the other side. Yeah. Um, for example, if I have uh, several uh, localizations in my database and assume they are all uh, extensions, and I want to build uh, upon them, uh, and I gave uh, on, uh, uh, in the um, configuration file uh, all those extensions. Uh, is it possible to install the extensions if uh, one of the localizations are not in the, not, not in the database, <coughs> or all of the uh, given extensions have to be present. So to actually write the code, um, if you look at how VS Code is working, when you download symbols, there's a mm -hmm. .VS Code folder, and I believe that's where all the symbol packages get placed. So if you have just the symbols, you can manually deploy that there, and you can write the code. Once you go to deploy the code, though, you will need that deployed on the system, because it will compile the package again once it's deployed to make sure that everything it needs is there and present. And if it's not, it will throw compilers at that point. Mm -hmm. so, so it will uh, compile, I if I comp uh, copy the uh, file in into the folder? So you don't have, you don't have conditional dependencies? Correct. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, maybe yes. I misunderstood the question. That yes. was yeah. C conditional so dependencies is something we want. It's not something we have currently. So. Okay. Okay. We've talked about it. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's not on the plan. <coughs> it, it's in the backlog down a ways. Unfortunately. Okay, I think there's one there's more there and one then. Here. Yeah, we're running out of time. I think we're out of time. Okay. We can go to the booth. Okay. If you try to look in the crystal ball, do you have an idea when the, when the idea of your transformation will be finished? Two years, five years, ten years, something else? So I think everybody has a different opinion on that. I think 10, 10 years is good. Okay, thanks. So you were nice, you gave a date. My answer would have been yes, I have an idea. Yeah. Oh, I, don't, I don't mind sharing. <laughs> okay, thank you very much everybody. Yeah, thank Appreciate you. It.